Welcome everyone to the sustainable procurement session of the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit 2021 edition. The objective of today's session is to look at how sustainable procurement can drive sustainability and progress towards the SDGs. And it's also an opportunity to hear about a new report that we're releasing today on advancing sustainability in UN procurement. To start off, we're going to hear from Sandao Jembo, Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, and Ambassador Anna Karin Enestrom from Sweden for welcome and opening remarks. Excellencies, business leaders, and friends, welcome to our Leaders Summit session on advancing sustainability in UN procurement, which has become more challenging than ever in these uncertain times and even more necessary. The global sustainability movement is now well established. For 20 years, it has built momentum across borders and across industries. Today, environmental, social, and governance factors, and of course, the sustainable development goals, figure prominently in business leaders' investment and operational decisions around the world. The United Nations has been a driving force for sustainability. It can fairly take credit for developing important frameworks like the guiding principles on business and human rights, and of course, the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. And yet, the UN system still needs to advance more sustainable practices in its own operations. This is especially true in procurement, where many governments and businesses have become more proactive in pioneering new standards and innovative practices. The good news is that the UN is well positioned to learn from frontrunners in the public and private sectors. It has a great opportunity to leverage roughly $19 billion in annual procurement as an incentive for more sustainable practices among its suppliers. To that end, and with generous support from the government of Sweden, the UN Global Compact and some of our key partners have carried out a special project on advancing sustainability in UN procurement. The project team spent much of the past year researching and compiling a report and reached some critical conclusions. First of all, the team identified the many benefits to be gained from improving UN performance on sustainable procurement. There are economic benefits, including long-term cost efficiencies, an increase in small and medium-sized enterprises as suppliers, and more investments in emerging economies. There are social benefits, such as improved workers' rights and decent working conditions and progress on gender equality and disability inclusion. And then there are environmental benefits in the form of reduced carbon emissions that help mitigate the worst impacts of climate change and thereby protect and promote biodiversity. Our project team also discovered that multiple champions of sustainable procurement are modeling good practices within the UN and they found enormous untapped potential for leadership and ambition in scaling up these practices. There is no shortage of know-how or standards when it comes to sustainable procurement in the UN system. The many champions who are already in place have planted the seeds for good practices to grow. But the team heard another clear message. Greater political will and more focused communication inside the UN system are essential to advancing sustainable procurement. Of course, no single organization has perfected sustainability in its procurement process. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. But what we do know is that sustainable procurement practices overall contribute to more inclusive and more resilient global supply chains. Today's session is intended to help identify good practices across sectors and offer the best path forward for the UN system's own sustainability journey. I hope your discussion on the heels of our report will show the way. Thank you. Executive Director, Director Ojambo, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to address you today on the topic on how we can advance sustainable procurement within the UN. 
The political vision for Sweden is that by 2030, all procurement funded by Swedish Development Corporation should have sustainability requirements. It is part of Sweden's Agenda 2030 strategy as well as the commitment to the Paris Agreement. In our work towards this vision, we recognize the potential of multilateral organizations to contribute considering both the magnitude of procurement volume as such and the strategic context. Well-managed sustainable public procurement is a powerful tool to increase sustainability, to encourage efficient use of scarce resources and to drive an anti-corruption. It has positive impact on multiple levels. It forces the seller to prove that winning product or service is contributing to the sustainable development goals throughout this total life cycle, as well as minimizing its negative impact. It creates incentives for improving the seller's supply chains and production as well as the actual use of goods and services procured. It can also create new partnership and innovation, critical for positive transformation. Our national experience is very much in line with this, pro proving that a well-designed procurement process contributes to product developments and competitiveness. With the global challenges of today, we cannot afford to do less. In fact, sustainable procurement is a way of financing the SDGs. Considering the large sums involved in the public procurement would sometimes is as high as 30% of GDP in developing countries. To this end, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA, has initiated a capacity development program to strengthen institutional capacity on sustainable public procurement in some partner countries. Last but not least, sustainable procurement is also a way of contributing to the prevalence of decent jobs. The UN has the potential to set and reinforce necessary standards when it comes to sustainable procurement practices, as well as the potential to drive innovation of sustainable solutions that will ultimately support its beneficiaries and lay the foundation for a greener and more resilient future. In line with this, we hope that the UN will continue to develop the UN Global Marketplace it is an important platform for companies to do business with the UN and understand what is in demand. Here transparency can be even better, making more procurement documentation and tender rewards available on the platform. Sweden is very pleased to have been able to support the report that will be presented today. It shows the importance to understand the current position of sustainability in the UN procurement. It is aimed at identifying practical ways for the UN to incorporate sustainability factors into its procurement processes, as well as drawing on good practices developed in the private and public sectors. I hope that the lessons learned can assist the UN system in designing and implementing a sustainable procurement strategy and practices that ultimately will, will positively influence markets throughout the world to produce more sustainable goods and services. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time and once again I would like to thank Global Compact for providing this platform for a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanda and uh, Anna Karin, for these welcome and opening remarks. Next, I'm going to introduce Mr. Uh, Christian Sanders. He is Assistant Secretary General for Supply Chain Management for the whole of the United Nations. Christian, over to you. Thank you, uh, Lila. Um, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here today to share with you perspectives on the importance of sustainability within our value chains. A matter as critical to the United Nations as it is to most of the millions of people we serve around the world. The United Nations as a system procures approximately 17 billion US dollars worth of goods and services annually. In 2020, we purchased goods and services from a total of 185 different member states. Effective and efficient procurement is an essential enabler for the organization to meet its many mandates globally. It is also one of the main driving forces for our, of our supply chain and a critical contributor to our footprints and legacy in the countries in which we work. 
as a publicly funded organization, we're committed to ensuring best value for money and to maintain the highest ethical standards and integrity throughout our operations. We demand that our supplier relations and all our supply, supply chain activities are conducted with consistent fairness, impeccable integrity, sincere transparency, all the while ensuring effective international competition. All these elements are critical for the United Nations to ma maintain its moral standing, its reputation and its relevance. It reassures member states that we're using the funds they entrust to us prudently and with the necessary due diligence and care. Over the past number of years, we have, with significant success, expanded our cooperation with businesses in developing countries and countries with ec economies in transition. We've increased the share of operations with women-owned businesses and made good progress with inclusive inclusivity overall. Although our supply chain activities are focused on supporting the mandates of the organization, we also have an undeniable commitment to the sustainable development goals. Goals five, six, seven, eight, 12, and 13 in particular. We have integrated sustainability considerations in numerous areas of our work and are continuously looking to incorporate innovative new processes, approaches, and solutions that can be implemented within the operational political constraints under which we operate. I mentioned specifically the political constraints, as without wider and deeper support along with the appropriate legislation from our member states, we are unable to seriously move forward with sustainability within our supply chain operations, and certainly not with the speed, the breadth, and the determination required to make the kind of impact we want to and will be capable of making. As of today, I cannot say in all transparency that we, the United Nations, are walking the talk and leading the way on sustainability in our supply chain operations. We could be doing much, much more. Indeed, we want to do much more and we have plans to do much more, but we are currently prevented from doing so by legislation enacted by member states. I thus take this opportunity to ask each of you here today to advocate on our behalf and to advocate at every available opportunity with your respective governments for their support for an immediate transition by the United Nations to a sustainable supply chain. You will agree that $17 billion is not insignificant, and this places us in a position where we could have a long-lasting positive impact on the ground and for the people we serve. Accomplishing this requires that we adopt a sustainable procurement strategy and policies and change how we conduct our operations on the ground. To begin with, the importance of building local supply capacities must have a stronger focus across the organization. And we, we must ensure that even the most temporary presence builds a sustainable legacy through supporting infrastructure development, including uh, clearly in, in such areas as renewable energy, but also strengthening local value chains, creating so socioeconomic opportunities, reducing the use of plastics and other waste, and so on. We must also encourage suppliers to rethink their operating models in line with the ESG goals and serve as a catalyst and as examples to others. In today's world, where we're losing human lives due to the direct effects of pollution in communities, where numbers of IDPs and refugees due to climate change will soon outnumber the numbers triggered by conflict, violence and war, where wars are waged over disappearing natural resources, we need to demonstrate that we can, that we can do more and will do better. Like COVID, climate change is a borderless crisis, the solutions to which have been talked about for far too long and postponed for far too long. The time for talk is over, what we need is action. Without delay, we must further inter internalize the Agenda 2030 across our policies and our operations globally. But what does that mean for us? We need to significantly increase the share of renewables in our energy consumption everywhere. We must consider first local market offerings that reduce the need for international shipping and other carbon intensive forms of transportation. We must support local communities and businesses wherever we serve. We want to encourage small uh, and medium sized businesses that are indeed the backbone of any transitioning economy and sustainable peace. Our infrastructure must be developed with sustainability in mind, both environmental and social. Our infrastructure must also be designed so as to serve a purpose beyond us it needs to be developed with the wider community in mind. And finally, we must start asking more from our suppliers. 
Dear member state representatives, colleagues and private sector partners, the eyes of the world are on us. It is our responsibility to live up to the sustainable development goals which our organization developed and member states endorsed. A clear signal needs to be de delivered to all businesses and communities the world over that they, we need to do things differently and to do so now. In view of the climate change and its impact on our societies, environmental sustainability in business and industry is no longer optional or aspirational. It has to be a mandatory requirement. A collective commitment from the United Nations and other major public sector procurement entities, along with that of governments, the international financial institutions and civil society, would allow industries and businesses everywhere, and especially those in developing countries, to transition quickly and make the necessary changes to be able to compete effectively in a global economy that is circular. We must take action. We have the moral responsibility along with the ability to do so. The time for empty rhetoric and repeated unfulfilled promises is past. It won't be easy. It's certainly achievable and the benefits, well, monumental. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and your interest in and your support to the United Nations and this absolutely critical issue. Thank you, Assistant Secretary General. This is a very strong and clear message on the challenges, uh, but also the responsibility and the, the huge opportunities for the UN to move towards uh, sustainable procurement. Uh, thank you for your time. So next, uh, I'm going to introduce um, Mr. I'm going to introduce Vashali uh, Sina, Chief Sustainability um, Officer at Renew Power. Over to you. Thanks, Leela. Thank you. Um, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. Good morning, distinguished guests and members in the audience. Um, you know, I, it's, it's fantastic to have this leader summit once again. Just want to compliment everybody who's played a role in organizing it in these challenging times. Also, congratulations on the report uh, which has come out on this very important topic and uh, including this discussion on procuring sustainably in dynamic circumstances and advancing sustainability in UN procurement. Let me start uh, by talking a little bit about why does procuring sustainably matter and why is it good for business? How does it advance key UN objectives uh, such as uh, progress with the sustainable development goals? I'd also like to throw some light on how we as a clean energy company, the leading um, in a renewable energy generator in India, how does sustainable procurement fit into our organization's ambitions towards SDGs and ESG performance. So procuring sustainably matters because raw materials for most industries have a high ecological footprint. Given that most raw materials required come from hard to abate sectors with high emissions and environmental impact. It is also good for the business because in the medium to long term, unsustainable procurement will cause significant financial social and environmental risks, reducing the triple bottom line of businesses. Unsustainable procurement also may lead to significant resource depletion, which will lead to supply chain risk in the future as well. Let's look at this in further depth and define it a little bit more. You know, procuring sustainably feeds into various UN key objectives given the linkage of sustainable procurement to various SDGs, most specifically SDG 12 on responsible production and consumption. Meeting the targets of which will definitely elevate the sustainable procurement scenario. Indirectly as well, procuring sustainably can have positive impacts on various SDGs, including but not necessarily limited to SDG 13, which is climate action, life under water and land, which is 14 and 15 SDG, sustainable cities and communities, which is SDG 11. And so there is a lot of integration, as we can see, with others, even innovation and infrastructure, which is SDG 9. And, um, you know, so if we work on all of these, uh, all of this can definitely accelerate uh, our journeys uh, to meet the goals and um, also set the pace uh, which we are all working towards together.
So um, it's important to recognize these interlinkages and ensure that we can work together to accelerate them. Sustainable procurement fits very well within our company's uh, ambitions towards SDG and uh, ESG performance as well. Um, given uh, that despite our business, which is a very positive business for the environment, because we are generating about close to 10 gigawatts of clean energy. And so we are offsetting a huge amount of carbon um, uh, footprint. Um, we are cognizant that if we don't apply what we are doing to the supply chain, our job and contribution will be incomplete. So we have a uh, significant role to play to green the supply chain. And we've seen that um, as we go about procuring, it's important to look at uh, contracts very seriously because that's a strong driver to ensure that um, you know the supply chain uh, delivers in a greener way. We found it extremely effective as we go about doing our business uh, to handhold some of the smaller vendors and to ensure that the uh, larger vendors, if they're not aligned, only get our business if, if, if they align with uh, our uh, requirements. So when it comes to labor, manufacturing, governance, et cetera, we're able to have an influence and a positive influence. So to that extent, we have floated our supplier chain uh, guidelines to evaluate our vendors and ensure that everybody in our organization follows them. Um, so, um, you know, these are some of the ways in uh, which we at Renew are contributing. I think uh, it's also important that, uh, you know, strategically we look at sustainable uh, procurement and uh, uh, the importance of um, uh, the sustainable um uh, 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 procurement is um, not only a sh a sh a medium term, but long term as well. And uh, companies with sust sustainable procurement practices have a high ESG score and performance. We have seen that benefit uh, us significantly in the way we raise funds, in the way we uh, you know, partner with uh, uh, exemplary partners. And so it's a win-win situation. Uh, there is a huge a wave of investors uh, who are looking at uh, uh, all of these activities. And um, uh, we believe that if we invest in uh, procuring in the right way, uh, we will be able to do better as far as our businesses is, is, are concerned. We owe it to not only each of us in the business community, but also for our broader communities and also for the next generation to preserve the planet for them. So. Um, um, you know, we are uh, really committed to procuring in a green way and contributing to the supply chain. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my views here. Thank you, Vaishali. This is a, an amazing um, example. Um, thank you for sharing the experience of your of your company. And uh, certainly, we need to increase the share of renewable energy uh, in terms of procurement. Uh, in order to meet uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, next, I'm going to introduce our colleague, uh, Ulysses Smith. He's the CEO of Telos Governance Advisors. Um, he will run the first uh, panel discussion for, for this session, and he's also the lead author for the report that we're releasing today. So, Ulysses, over to you. Thanks very much, Leela. I appreciate it. And good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone joining us today. It's really a privilege and a pleasure to be with you today. Um, on behalf of the project team, I want to thank you and the Global Compact and our colleagues at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs for the opportunity to have worked on this incredibly fascinating project on such an important topic and to present our report uh, today. Um, Telos and Deborah Voisin Plimpton uh, the law firm um, that also joined us uh, uh, on this project in equal share to Telos um, are really happy to be with you. Um, we'd like to also thank the many colleagues who, despite all the challenges of 2020 that we all experienced, were so generous with their time and their knowledge and their perspective and from whom we learned so much. These include many uh, from within the UN system, as well as numerous private sector representatives, people from government and civil society. Uh, thankfully, we will hear from two UN representatives shortly, but there were many, many more that we spoke to 
during the course uh, of this project. Um, by way of quick background, uh, I am going to give a little bit of an overview uh, of the sustainable procurement project, um, which will necessarily be a very thin thumbnail. Um, we have a, a 90 something page report that I hope you all will dive into and digest. There's a lot of uh, good information and ideas in there, we hope. Um, this will be a very uh, short whistle-stop tour uh, of that report. Um, our work on the project was premised on a few basic insights. First, that leveraging procurement, which often seems like a dry, esoteric, largely technical undertaking, is in fact an underappreciated and underutilized means of advancing progress with the SDGs, ESG, and broader social and economic development objectives. This is true for the UN with its 17 or 18 billion US dollars in annual expenditure, but it's true within the private sector and government as well. Second, that while the UN system rightly gets credit for sparking and then pioneering the sustainability movement that we see proliferating today, there are numerous actors innovating in that space and leading the charge currently. And third, the spirit of collaboration and common values across sectors, geographies, and expertise offer numerous opportunities for sharing knowledge, experience, and good practice between sectors with a common interest in advancing sustainable economic and social development. Now, I just wanna mention that we do have slides and I don't know if, um, if uh, the support can pull uh, those up. You'll see here the cover, uh, the beautiful cover of the report. Um, um, but I will um, move on quickly to uh, slide two, um, if that's okay. Um, as I said, it's really important to emphasize that, that the presentation today is quite brief. Um, I fear that we won't really do sufficient justice to um, what's in the report, as well as um, all the great work and in, in, interesting things happening within the UN on sustainable procurement. But I do refer you particularly to section four, um, which sets out um, our, our description of the various funds and programs and at the UN secretariat level of the many things that are actually going on currently, which are quite positive. Um, in support of the project in 2019, Telos and Devavoyes undertook a lengthy information gathering process to understand the current status of sustainability, which we define broadly in UN procurement practices. This effort was facilitated by the UN Global Compact and supported by the government of Sweden and culminated in the report that you have today, Advancing Sustainability in UN Procurement. The observations and recommendations contained in the report are the result of our efforts over the last year and a half to review key procurement policies and interview actors in the procurement space, both within the UN, the private sector, and the public sector and civil society. We've reviewed key UN reports, policies and guidelines, procurement policies and guidance issued by institutions outside of the UN. And in terms of interviews, we had detailed discussions with representatives of the UN Secretariat, UN Ops, UN Environmental Program, UN Development Program, UNHCR, UN OCHA, and UNICEF. These interviews were invaluable for the development of the report. With respect to sustainable procurement within the UN, we learned a number of things. First, that the UN at both the Secretariat and the funds and programs level has indeed taken a broad range of meaningful steps to advance sustainability in the procurement process. However, on that positive note, it's also important to recognize that there is significant variability in the progress that has been made with some entities quite advanced while others continuing to experience significant impediments. The ASG, uh, a moment ago, Christian Saunders mentioned the political will challenges. That is something that we certainly heard about and is clear that uh, that is a challenge that really limits progress on advancing sustainable procurement. However, in this varied context, there were a number of good practices in place representing considerable expertise and commitment that can be built upon. These include, among other things, the existence of clearly defined strategies, processes, and procedures regarding sustainability and relevant procurement practices. Several entities have quite robust processes in place. To give just one example, UNDP and its policies recognizes procurement as an essential strategic function and encourages its vendors to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies aligned with Global Compact's 10 principles in the areas of human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. In addition, we saw significant efforts on the part of funds and programs 
to try to encourage support from donors and internal stakeholders on advancing sustainable procurement and raising the profile of this issue. We saw efforts to integrate sustainability early in procurement planning and in procurement processes more generally. We also saw noteworthy efforts to develop expertise, particularly within funds and programs on issues related to sustainable procurement. By way of example here, UN Ops conducts workshops and trainings for procurement professionals on embedding sustainability in procurement processes through workshops. UNICEF has conducted webinars on sustainable procurement for country and regional offices and has created an internal reference library that compiles information on sustainable procurement practices. There are many other noteworthy examples that I could cite. However, we will hear from a couple of uh, UN representatives shortly, and I hope we'll hear a little bit more from them on some of the other interesting and innovative things that they're doing currently. I'd like to now hand it over to Natalie and David from Debevoise and Plimpton, who will discuss sustainable procurement outside the UN and then dig into, in a bit more detail, the observations and recommendations contained in the report. Thanks for very much. Over to you, Natalie and David. Thank you very much, Ulysses. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I echo Ulysses' thanks and recognition for those who have supported our work on the report and already contributed to the, uh, the contents that Ulysses has already begun to describe. If we could pull back up the slides, please, and go to slide three, I will continue the whistle-stop tour, focusing on sustainable procurement outside the UN system, before handing over to my partner, David Rifkin, who will uh, give an overview of our observations and recommendations recommendations. So while the UN system is unique in several respects, the guidance and good practices developed by the leading private and public sector organizations that we've already heard about uh, by earlier speakers, uh, and in fact other panels at the Leaders Summit, can very well inform the efforts at the UN, particularly in response to similar types of challenges that UN entities may face. Now, in our interviews and research, the key challenges faced by private and public sector organizations in implementing or advancing sustainable procurement were very similar to the challenges that we heard about when we spoke with UN colleagues. And when we heard from Ms. Sinna from Renew Power earlier, uh, again, some of these will, will resonate. Broadly speaking, they resolved into four kinds of main concerns. First, that sustainable procurement would be a cost burden, a net cost burden, for the procuring entity. Second, a concern that only a limited number of vendors would have sufficient capacity to meet sustainability standards so that you would actually limit the pool of vendors rather than expand it. Third, concern that the organization itself, the procuring entity, didn't have sufficient internal expertise to implement sustainable procurement practices. And finally, concern that there wouldn't be internal support, that key stakeholders would not fully support and therefore help drive and sustain the required changes to the organization's practices and culture. And again, what we saw in terms of the trends and best practices, uh, again, Ms. Ms. Sinna's earlier comments resonated with a lot of these. Uh, these trends and best practices that emerged in response to these challenges, we found can very well inform the way that they are tackled uh, within the UN system. So these are several and they are detailed uh, in our report. First, adopting a clearly defined strategy and guidelines for vendors that expressly incorporate sustainability principles, such as the 10 principles for the UN Global Compact. Second, ensuring that leading players, so this is both the tone from the top and key uh, procurement professionals within the organization, don't consider sustainability as an afterthought, but rather work to fully integrate these considerations into the procurement process and throughout the organization. Third, that these same leading players understand that sustainable procurement can be an opportunity to mitigate risks in their own supply chains by, for example, conducting due diligence on the sustainable practices of vendors, whether in-house or using a third-party sustainability assessment firm. Once you understand what those risks or gaps or shortcomings may be, and particularly in the private sector, we saw a trend of offering trainings and incentives to vendors to adopt sustainable uh, practices, or uh, uh, through those internal assessments, assisting vendors to improve in areas where they may be gaps. 
critically, and this is the, the sixth uh, uh, factor that we noticed, there was a conscious effort to quote unquote, market sustainability as an opportunity for better outcomes. So this is both on the part of the procuring entity and for the vendors. So for the procuring entity, uh, speaking about sustainable procurement in terms of long-term cost reduction, risk mitigation, as a tool to advance the organization's own objectives or brand, and to ultimately obtain higher quality or more innovative products and services. And for the vendors, adoption of sustainable practices could lead to increased opportunities. As we have all seen, there's increased demand both for the consumer market and therefore for organizations and firms and companies uh, to look to adopt and then follow through with sustainability criteria. What we have seen in terms of some particularly innovative uh, approaches, especially in the private sector, include, for example, moving away from a compliance model where you require suppliers to meet certain requirements, and if they don't, then they're penalized by being barred from future bids um, and therefore blocked from the opportunity, uh, instead moving to a collective and collaborative approach to sustainable procurement one that is frankly more consistent with the overall goal of the SDGs and uh, integrating technology as we all have been uh, uh, forced to do over the last year um, to really advance these goals and to build them into procurement practices and the ways in which we interact within our organizations and with our vendors. So with that, again, very, very quick overview of some of the uh, uh, resonances that we saw in terms of the challenges and the solutions outside of the UN system. I turn it over to David uh, for the summary of observations and recommendations. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Ulysses. And uh, it was certainly a pleasure working with Telos on in uh, preparing and drafting this report, which we hope will be very helpful to all of you. Um, we can make a number of general observations about UN practices on sustainable procurement. Um, some of them have already been made uh, by Ulysses, and, and interestingly, of course, the concerns that were expressed by the many people we, we interviewed within the UN system were very similar to those that were expressed within the private uh, companies uh, that Natalie just uh, described. Um, but We've seen how private companies can get past those concerns, and we're hoping that our report is going to help the UN as well uh, build on the, for example, the very strong message that we heard from Assistant Secretary General uh, Saunders earlier uh, in this session. Um, first, despite the UN's regular statements about the importance of sustainable development uh, going back to 2008, obviously including the sustainable development goals and the agenda for sustainable development, um, there is still a perceived lack of mandate uh, within the UN, and this, that constrains a more ambitious uh, uh, program uh, by those who are actually working on procurement. Procurement officers have consistently referred to the lack of mandate as a key challenge in adopting more robust uh, practices. Um, but um, this and this lack of formal mandate can be seen in many of the UN's own documents. The UN Supplier Code of Conduct, for example, uh, does not mandate compliance with the UN's own global compact labor, human rights, environmental, and ethical standards, but merely says that uh, compliance is quote unquote expected. Similarly, the 2020 procurement manual that, that the UNPD has just issued has broader language encouraging sustainability considerations generally, but it never uses the term sustainable development, uh, procurement rather. Um, We've also seen the perception within the UN system that some member states, uh, from particularly from developing countries, view sustainable procurement as a disadvantage to the suppliers in their own countries. We know from uh, quantitative data that that isn't in fact the case and from the work that uh, many of the U different UN agencies have done where they we, uh, we have seen that procurement from developing countries has consistently grown across the UN system, particularly at the funds and programs, le programs level, even while sustainable procurement has been uh, pursued by organizations like the UNOPS and the UNDP, uh, which make it a core requirement of their tender and evaluation process. Um, second, UN officers often cite to the sustainability sustainability as uh, uh, having extra costs. Um, we 
know that that is, again, not uh, the case uh, as sustainable procurement often uh, brings tangible and intangible benefits and the costs are often uh, inaccurately and overstated. Um, and finally, the UN system is not using the own, its own internal expertise. As you've heard, many agencies within the UN are, in fact, uh, uh, doing very strong things to, to uh, 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 encourage sustainable and, and require sustainable procurement and other agencies can certainly learn from that. So let's move to the recommendations again. Um, we're trying to run through this in a very quick way um, and we hope you'll look at the full report. But based upon the input we've had from stakeholders within the UN and what we heard in terms of best practices from the private uh, uh, practice, pr private sector, um, we, we have a number of recommendations. First is, even within existing constraints, seek opportunities. And that includes engaging with local businesses to help them raise, uh, to help them understand the advantages of sustainable uh, procurement. Um, uh, to take one example, the UN could engage uh, uh, through the UN Global Compact local networks to support and raise an awareness of the business case for becoming a sustainable supplier. And again, you heard that from our, our earlier speaker as well. And use the internal expertise that has been developed by the UNDP, UNICEF, UNEP, and some others to help understand um, uh, and build expertise throughout the UN system. Second, we need to lay the groundwork for a more ambitious approach. And certainly, again, the, the, the speech by uh, Assistant Secretary General Saunders today needs to be promulgated throughout the entire U.S. system so that the system knows that the U.N. Secretariat is, is fully behind taking the kinds of ambitious steps uh, that need to be undertaken. Um, and this can be done, again, by promoting to member states and to stakeholders the benefits of sustainable procurement and, importantly, to bust the myths of additional cost. Um, it, as, as you know, the UN has more than $19 billion annually in procurement. So just think about the difference that that kind of ambitious approach with a clear message uh, from the leadership of the UN across the board uh, the kind of change that that can bring in developing and emerging countries and elsewhere uh, if the UN is using that $19 billion um, as a tool to build sustainable develop, uh, procurement and sustainable development for all the reasons um, that Assistant Secretary General Saunders mentioned earlier. Um, uh, again, some of that is going to come from busting the myths of additional cost um, and there's quantitative data that would help show that. Um, and finally, um, the UN can do better simply by developing more partnerships and, and platforms, exploring opportunities for collaborative engagement on these types of issues between the various agencies within the UN system, the UN Global Compact, uh, and a private uh, um, uh, private parties that are very willing to work with the UN in, um, in promoting sustainable procurement uh, throughout its system. So we hope this has given you a nice overview of the report. Um, and let me turn it now back to Ulysses, who will introduce our other two panelists to comment on the report. Thank you, David. And thank you, Natalie, uh, for that very brief um, but very uh, illuminating uh, presentation on the um, observations and findings in the report and the recommendations. Um, now it is a pleasure to uh, bring in our UN speakers uh, to provide their reflections on the report and on the issues underlying it. Um, these are both people that we had the pleasure of speaking with during the course of the, the project and, and, and preparation of the report. Um, and I can tell you personally, I learned uh, a tremendous amount from both of them. Um, first, we will hear from Alexander Putio, who uh, sits uh, within the office of the Assistant Secretary General for Supply Chain Management. And second, we will hear from Marcus McKay, who is the Su Sustainability Procurement Manager um, at UN Ops. Alexander, please welcome and come on in. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. And good morning, everyone. And again, my sincere thanks uh, for involving us. This uh, I remember already a few years ago when, when we first heard of, of this uh, this program and, and the report being drafted, you know, the uh, the, the first uh, emotion that, that came was, was awe that someone is, is, is uh, courageous enough to do this. And the second uh, emotion was envy in a sense that why why didn't we do this? Uh, as you heard uh, from my, my, my boss, uh, Christian Saunders, 
you know, we are we are very, very much in, in line uh, in intellectually and, and, and have shared the same ambitions, but uh, qu quite frankly, have, have found ourselves in, in, a, in a situation where you know operationally are are uh, there are urgencies elsewhere that, that keep uh, keep our mind from uh, sustainable procurement. And and uh, you know, if we are even more candid, there, there are uh, entities and, and, and powers out there that uh, that wish to keep it the, the situation. So uh, so we were indeed extremely delighted to to see. Uh, that this this uh, the program of action take place, and my my thanks also for for Debuwa, uh, for, for and, and indeed Telos and, and Global Compact for for pushing this through. I, I we've quite often with my colleagues looked back at the uh, the roundtable that we had, I believe a, a bit over a year ago, and and my hope is that we'll have similar similar uh, setups going forward for for a simple reason. One of the uh, uh, the, the recommendations that the, the report makes, or actually quite a few of them, speak to collaboration. And, and perhaps I'll, I'll start with this in, in terms of the things that we need to do to get to where ASG Saunders and, and the report rightfully wants to, uh, to place entities like the UN Secretariat. We do need to more bravely break the silos between the agencies, uh, the funds and programs, and, and even within the, the UN system and the Secretariat itself. So if, if, if I'll give you a very concrete example, uh, the, the only reason why I know my colleagues who work on sustainability as a su subject matter, not, out, not necessarily as something that concerns the supply chain and procurement, but as, as, a, as, as the SDGs and on reporting within the Secretariat's own performance, uh, is because we used to sit next to them uh, by accident on the 20th floor of the Secretariat building. Uh, there are quite uh, quite few opportunities to meet them in person, and they're very. Uh, and we have them in the in the roundtable. They are extremely knowledgeable and very passionate about helping uh, people like uh, us in the supply chain. But there are very few opportunities for us to formally engage with them in the exchange of ideas and, and policy reviews. And I hope that our colleague from UNOPS will will show a more nimble and agile uh, view of this. But that's the reality. Uh, in terms of what the Secretariat is, is facing, we are still very much siloed and, and that's something that our, our leadership and us on the working level need to take much more seriously if we are to, uh, to actually live up to the, uh, the expectations and, 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 and do right by, by, by our expenditures and indeed to, uh, to meet the recommendations of collaboration. And the same goes for them reaching out to, uh, to the other agencies. And, 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 and for example, uh, you know, to, to be very, very candid again, you know, today is one of the rare opportunities for me to meet someone uh, from UNOPS who works in the same area. Uh, we have uh, qu quite a few high level uh, venues where our bosses I'm sure have met and have discussed, but here, on the working level, there, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for us to, to engage and share ideas. And, and, and again, makes, makes the global compacts work here uh, even, even much, much more uh, valuable. So thank you again uh, for that. Uh, what I wanted to also uh, lead off with was, was some, uh, in terms of the statistics, we, we heard uh, multiple billions here and there. Uh, there, there. The situation is, is better and it's, it's kind of also worse if we look at the entirety of what, for example, someone like ASG Saunders, what he actually signs under his authority. So under the supply chain within, within the UN Secretariat, we nowadays also have the uniformed capabilities which uh, I, I believe uh, is, is a not, it doubles more or less his de annual deal flow uh, if we uh, if we look at pre early procurement and and uh, having having worked on those treaties uh, they're, they're obviously contracts but they're signed by member states often at the ministerial level so we elevate them to a fancier title but they're contracts nonetheless uh, we do acquire services we acquire goods we we go to the level of of actually detailing how many handkerchiefs. Uh, and and uh, what what type of solar panel generated uh, in kitchens we expect member states to bring with their troops? And if this is in procurement, then I don't know what is. And if we uh, approach this expenditure with the, uh, the the same same ambition of of making it sustainable and, and greener, uh, I, I think we could we could greatly expand upon the the power that ASG Saunders mentioned of, of our of our expenditures. But but that that I, I put this in the uh, the category of, of black pelt tips. I, I think I I don't think we're necessarily ready to to discuss uh, utilizing the power of, of of these kind of quasi procurement flows. But these are significant expenditures. Expenditures and and with very simple uh, changes of rules and policies, uh, we we could uh, leverage the, their power as as well. And and, and with that, I'll, I'll go to uh, the, the echoing the Saunders statement about how how much has been done. Indeed, we you know, we are the in the secretary, we're the home of the SDGs, and we have hundreds and hundreds of colleagues who are working on the uh, programmatic work 
uh, uh, in delivering upon these, and I mean, we're, we're setting the principles, and 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 but we're not leading by example, which which in, indeed is is also true that much 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 needs to be done with this uh, in terms of using procurement strategically uh, and going going deeper into delivering local sustainability and thinking beyond our state. So that's that's something that that has been very difficult for us to do thus far, we, because of again budget reasons. So these might might sound like cop outs or, or hand waving, but in in reality we are we are constricted by quite a few things in the secretariat specifically. We have uh, the, the general assembly, we have the, the security council right in our building, so we have we are under quite heavy scrutiny from directly the member states, which I understand many of our sibling UN entities have have uh, much lighter uh, management structures when it comes to reporting. To members and my apologies i believe i was muted for a second uh so here we go so in, in the, as, as i was mentioning it's, it's very difficult uh, for us to uh deliver local sustainability and think beyond our state uh, in, in cases where our budgeting is is annual and and has is, has essentially been uh, been um, set up in a way that it, it tries to uh, to take everything out out of the system uh, and be as efficient as possible within a short conduct uh, uh, and very condensed period of time. So it, it just doesn't necessarily give the opportunity for people to uh, to think long term and sustainably. So that's that's another thing that we could uh, set up. But in, in terms of the uh, dispelling the myths, we just heard from our. Uh, from our partners, Natalie and, and David, uh, I, I fully agree. There, there, there's no such thing as sustainable procurement uh, being more expensive. Uh, that's that's simply not true an, anymore. I think that was a misconception from 20, 30 years ago when green technologies indeed were the only ways of being uh, sustainable and they were more expensive at the time, but that's not true. And it's also not a disadvantage to contractors. And that's also a, uh, the the, uh, the tr truth. Uh, if we look at the statistics, like provided by Global Compact uh, and, and many others, there are a, a number, a growing, growing number of, of uh, uh, companies out there in all of our member states who are able to meet these requirements. And then, very finally, before we move on, uh, uh, I, I would like to say that you know th th there are ways of doing this already. The formal mandate, indeed, is is missing. Uh, but for for people who work in procurement uh, and and specifically people who work under the kind guide, guidance of, of Christian and and Neritz, who you'll you'll hear from soon, uh, then you know there are ways we can we can already approach these. Uh, for example, the life cycle uh, concept is is something that can be very powerful when applied correctly in procurement, and it, it can be used if not as a, as a full means of of approaching sustainability as a proxy. And also, contracts are extremely powerful tools, so th th we should not. Uh, look, look, look uh, into the future as saying, well, we need a formal mandate to 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 engage in sustainable practices. We already sign hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts on a daily basis within the Secretariat and elsewhere, and and these contracts can can indeed be uh, established in a way that we work with the KPIs and the life cycle con uh, concept, so that we we start introducing sustainability once one step at a time. So again, my my sincere thanks, and I very much look forward to. Hearing, hearing from our colleagues in UNOPS and what, how, how they uh, uh, intend to, uh, to, uh, to implement some of the recommendations of this report. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. That was terrific. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I want to move quickly on to Marcus uh, to make sure that we have time for um, a wonderful panel that will follow, um, led by Leela here shortly. So please, over to you, Marcus. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, everyone, for having me. And on behalf of UNOPS, thank you very much. Um, I think the first thing <clears throat> I'd like to comment on is not only was it um, a pleasure and a privilege to participate in this exercise or this project, but also on reading and reviewing the, the final product, I think I want to applaud um, um, Ulysses and his team for, for the fantastic work that they did. I think for the benefit of time, um, I'm not going to you know, individual comment um, on the the follow up of the recommendation uh, um, on the observations that were made. I'll just try and make a, a holistic echo of the comments that we received from our from our colleagues. But um, what I do want to try and uh, focus on is from a UNOS perspective is that you know we don't see this um, as a hindering process. In fact, we see it as achieving some of the key principles of of, of procurement um, practices and procurement principles. And we've spent many years trying to 
slowly integrate this into our processes. Uh, we see sustainable pro procurement as complementing best value for money. Um, we see it as complementing fairness. We see it as bringing integrity as well as transparency and ultimately uh, effective competition. But this also comes with the development of the markets and the developments and the engagement of um, our supplier base, um, as was mentioned, which I'll touch upon um, a little bit later. It's also clear that it's in the best interest of UNOPS as well as its partners, as been echoed um, by the, the members of this um, segment. You know, we see that you know currently the World Bank is is estimating between 13 and 20 percent of global GB, GDP is going through uh, public um, procurement. Um, so we see that we have huge opportunities for leverage, and we have huge opportunities um, to, to to create value. But it's important that you know this is done in an, an, an adequate way. It's also done in a comprehensive manner. So that we can try and achieve the the the, the cross cutting and the overarching um, economic, social, and environmental benefits, um, long term cost um, efficiencies, you know, protection of human rights, improved labour conditions, um, leveraging what's already in place for improved gender equality, the enhancements that we're getting in in disability um, inclusion, as well as the environmental factors from the reduction of carbon emissions and and the focus on on climate change. And this is a very complicated set, complicated set of, of areas, and we have to make sure that our approach is comprehensive, but it's also adaptable. Um, one of the things um, I'm working on at the moment with my colleague, um, who's going to speak shortly um, in the panel, is that we've, we're finalizing the revision of our procurement policies, as well as the finalizing the um, procurement, um, sustainable procurement policy, I apologize. And our sustainable procurement framework is going to be released um, from, um, from July the 1st. But we've already had uh, mandatory measures in place, which have been effective since um, January 2020. This is why when I was reading the recommendations, um, I was very proud and not only to be part of, but also to speak on behalf of the organization that we're already starting to, to mainstream and bring into, into um, consideration some of the recommendations that have been highlighted. Um, what stood out from the recommendations perspective of the, of the report, and if I can also um, um, recognize Mr. Saunders' comment, is the, the call for action. And, and it's very clear that there needs to be a focused uh, and concerted um, effort towards continuous improvement. Um, we need to have more engagement. Um, we need to look at um, not only the upstream, but also the downstream engagement. We need to work with our partners. and. We critically need to work with our, our suppliers and our vendors. And I want to thank Ms. Reed for bringing this up by highlighting the importance that vendors play in this role. One of the uh, concerted efforts that UNOPS has put in um, over the last um, couple of years has been a dedicated focus to engaging with supplier sustainability. As I mentioned earlier on, you know the the amount of engagement that goes through the public um, through public procurement going through the transactional um, environment of suppliers, it's critical that we engage with our suppliers and we we, we work on a, on a collaborative collective um, force going forward. So, you know, we're very proud of, of um, the work that's going on in the UN environment. We do see that it's important that we need to focus on mainstreaming um, what policies and uh, um, we have in place already and what we can strengthen. Rooting um, um, the, the areas of focus in existing um, po the policy frameworks. Um, into existing um, um, supplier codes of conduct and recognizing, um, for example, the UN um, Global Compact and the pretend principles, which are also cited and, and, and um, referenced throughout um, our policy instruments. So from our side, we're very happy, we're very proud. Um, we want to continue to work and, and expand and, and, um, and, um, and um, improve our areas of engagement in sustainable procurement. UNOPS has um, a history uh, of engaging and developing and expanding this area. And actually, we're very excited because it comes at a timely point for us because we're revising and releasing our sustainable procurement framework um, at the moment. So um, I'll hand it back over to you. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to um, engaging with my colleagues uh, um, going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcus. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, just to close out, and we'll hand it back to Leela in just a second. I just, once again, on behalf of the the, the team, Debo Voice and Telos, uh, want to say thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to work on this amazing project. Uh, this issue is near and dear to our hearts, um, and is uh, such an opportunity for pushing forward with the SDGs. Um, and we look forward to continuing um, to stay 
tuned in and engaged and um, working with you um, on these important issues. Leela, back over to you. Thanks again for having us. Thank you, Ulysses, and uh, amazing discussion and, and panel. Um, with the uh, the 30 minutes that we have left, um, I'm going to move it over to uh, our next panel, um, actually bringing um, five new speakers uh, to talk about uh, procuring sustainably in dynamic circumstances. Um, and I'll, I'm delighted to be moderating um, this next panel. So um, I'm going to introduce right away our, our panelists. Uh, we have Francisco Razzolini. He's the uh, Director of Industrial Technology Innovation Sustainability at Clubin, a Brazilian company. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hello, we distinguished have audience. We have uh, Eva Grumby, uh, Deputy Executive Director at the Danish Institute on, on Human Rights. Welcome, good to see you. Um, Santiago Milan, he's the Director and Officer in Charge uh, for Procurement at UNOPS, uh, the UN Office for uh, Project Services. And uh, Neris Bias, uh, the um, Mazora, um, the director of the procurement division uh, at the United Nations. And uh, finally, Torben Sol, he is officer in charge uh, for the procurement services at UNDP. So good to have you all. Um, I'm going to start with a, a broad opening question for, for all of the panelists, just to tell us about the current state uh, of procuring sustainably in your organization. What are some of the recent developments, trends that you see, um, and also given that uh, we've been impacted by the COVID pandemic, um, how did this uh, impact uh, your ability to uh, procure in a sustainable manner? So let's let's ask with let's start with uh, Francisco and then go to Eva. Hi, thank you, Lila. Thank you for the question. In this, uh, for everybody, for all the world, a very challenging moment. Uh, uh, where I'm talking here from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Brazil is heavily impacted also by the COVID situation. And specifically in our uh, industry, in our supply chain, we've been uh, uh, working very, very hard with our suppliers. Uh, first, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a, a former procurement officer too, but uh, working with sustainability innovations and uh, capital projects. Clubbing is a, a 122 years uh, old company in Brazil, quite old for our uh, part of the, the world. So uh, we've been tackling sustainability issues uh, since the beginning. We work uh, with, uh, let's say, planted forests uh, in this uh, converting it to uh, paper and paper packaging specifically and also cellulose fibers for the market. So 80% of our, our products goes to uh, very uh, dedicated markets in these moments, uh, like the food and hygiene industry. So we are uh, in, in a change that cannot be uh, interrupted. Otherwise, we're going to impact the whole economy. In this moment, that economy is already very, very well impacted. So we've been uh, working very, very hard uh, with uh, uh, our suppliers. We have uh, 7,800 suppliers on all over our chain, our, our uh, uh, yearly purchases are something like uh, two billion dollars on that. So, uh, working um, on, on the definition of programs with this uh, supply chain it was very, very important. So, in in, in these moments of uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, we have the say delays, we have uh, small disruptions, we have financial constraints all over the chain, and we had to adjust uh, and adjust faster. Uh, with our uh, suppliers involving them in all the necessary work and and and, pro and procedures and and also protocols to to keep them in a very safe side on the first uh, part and also to continue uh, uh, supplying to continue involving uh, our chain. So we've been working also a lot. Uh, in trying in bringing them to the sustainable issues, this was even before the COVID situation, the COVID pandemic to, uh, last, since last year, uh, involving them in, in all the SDGs and also important programs to 
uh, having then uh, reducing their emissions and and being more and more sustainable. So a lot of work from the, from our side here. Sorry, I'm handing that over to you, Leila. So. Thank you. Um, I seem to have lost the connection for a second, but uh, thanks, thanks so much for this, uh, these comments, your experience uh, from from Brazil, and 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 the great the great opportunities that you mentioned there. Um, Eva, over to you. Um, uh, what would you say are the current trends? Uh, your organization is working also across many uh, many sectors and and with multiple partners. Thank you very much, uh, Lila, and, and thank you already for a very rich discussion uh, under this uh, this uh, um, event. Um, well, I'm representing the, the Danish Institute for, for Human Rights, and we are a national institution, um, a state institution, but independent of the government. And as you said, Lila, working with a number of partners uh, also uh, outside Denmark, um, you could say our perspective is really to to see how one can advance sustainable uh, procurement uh, by understanding also the human rights perspective in sustainable procurement. Um, we believe it's relevant for all three dimensions of uh, sustainability, but of course with the social uh, dimension most prominent where you have explicitly uh, ties to, to human rights standards. So one could of course ask, uh, what does human rights perspective mean in a sustainable, sustainable uh, procurement context? What does it look like? Um, and here I would say public procurement, uh, of course the state can contract out the supply and goods of services, but it cannot contract, contract out its uh, human rights obligations. It needs to understand and, and, and re realize the responsibility to pre protect human rights abuses, whether it's forced labor or human trafficking, but also using public procurement as a tool to advance uh, human rights, uh, favor specific groups, uh, it could be women, indigenous peoples. Uh, and the UN guiding principles for human rights and business that, that has been celebrated today has specific guidance on this also to, towards states. When it comes to private procurement, what we're looking at is also uh, at the UN guiding principles, uh, because it also clearly states the, the responsibility for, for corporates uh, or companies to respect human rights. And here, human rights due diligence uh, is a tool that really brings in that human rights perspective. Uh, and uh, as stated in the report that was uh, just presented before, uh, there is a grow growing evidence that, that the respecting or responsible uh, human rights business uh, and business conduct is actually good for business. So we're looking very much into that uh, type and uh, that narrative that the report also talks about on the opportunities that procurement can give, both from a public uh, procurement uh, side, but also from a private procurement side. Thank you. Excellent. And um, I'm going to ask the same uh, question to our three uh, panelists uh, from the UN. Uh, in the order that that we have here, um, I'll start with uh, with Santiago, with with Neris, and then Torben. Hi everyone, and uh, good morning and good afternoon from from Copenhagen. Um, so yes, my name is Santiago Mike Millan. I'm a procurement senior manager at UNOPS. I'm responsible for policy and uh, for sustainable procurement, for e procurement, and for training. So I, I and I'm currently also the the acting director. Uh, so I work very closely with uh, with Marcus and his team of dedicated uh, sustainable procurement professionals on the implementation of uh, sustainable procurement at UNOPS. Um, in terms of where we are as, a, as an organization, as Marcus also uh, alluded to before and, and, and has come out on the on the report, uh, you know, we have progressively advanced on the operationalization of sustainable procurement over the years. And this is a journey we started uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, you know, and something that we, uh, you know, as Marcus also mentioned before, that we uh, felt confident in doing uh, over a year ago uh, was to in fact move from a situation where we were recommending or strongly recommending the, the adoption of certain uh, sustainability requirements or criteria into our procurement processes into under certain circumstances, making it uh, uh, mandatory. And of course, that's something that we uh, considered very carefully, um, including the, the potential impacts it would have within our organization and also within our supplier base. But it's something that uh, a year and a half onwards, uh, you know, it's something that we see 
uh, has helped us uh, advance in this journey. And that's something that um, uh, you know, not only has it not hindered um, our approach to procurement, but in, for, in, in fact, it has uh, reinforced it. Um, but I would also say is that at UNOPS, we, we have a um, you know, multifaceted approach to, to sustainable procurement. So we, you know, we do look at the, the requirements of the goods and services we, we procure. Uh, but then we also look at other important aspects uh, that relate to how we engage with suppliers, so such as our supplier sustainability program that uh, Marcus alluded before. Uh, but we also have uh, active and dedicated efforts into supplier uh, diversity and inclusion, ensuring that our supplier base is as uh, diverse and representative of the beneficiaries we ultimately uh, work for. Uh, we also look into gender responsive procurement, total cost of ownership, uh, and 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 so on. And you know, for UNOPS, you know, which is an organization that procures uh, over 1.2 billion dollars per year. Uh, you know, and we are a very decentralized organization. So over 90% of that procurement is done through our offices spread out around, around the world uh, through a supplier base of over 6,000 uh, suppliers from over 150 countries. Um, you know, we were, uh, you know, at some points doubting whether, you know, these efforts and, and these requirements, uh, you know, would be uh, followed by, uh, by our supplier community and, and in fact, uh, to our, you know, very positive surprise. Um, and, you know, there's always been, you know, great encouragement, great reaction uh, from uh, from companies from from all the countries that we work at. Uh, you know, so so clearly, and, and and I think the report also highlights that. Uh, of course, uh, buying entities, including those at the UN, uh, you know, can put in you know normative frameworks, but then it has to be a collaborative effort uh, with the with the private sector. Uh, and uh, as some of the other colleagues mentioned earlier, it cannot be seen um, as a punitive approach. Uh, it has to be a, a collaborative uh, approach. And, and that's also something that we've been increasingly doing over, particularly over the last uh, two years or so, where uh, you know, we're working with suppliers through um, the issuance of our CAPA or corrective and, and uh, preventive action plans on on a voluntary basis, how they can better themselves, including how they can further align themselves to the principles in the UN Supplier Code of Conduct, uh, in the uh, UN Global Compact, and, and other important uh, normative uh, instruments. And of course, in the in a context of COVID, it, it's been a challenge for an organization such as UNOPS, and of course, it's not the only one in the UN where we've been, you know, very active in the in supporting uh, your countries and partners with their procurement response to COVID, so procuring uh, PPE and other equipment. Uh, we've also seen opportunities there to approach it through a sustainability lens in terms of ensuring that there's waste management treatment for, for the PPE that is procured, ensuring that the oxygen plants and other equipment can be maintained and, and, and sustained over time, etc. So I think there's always opportunity despite the despite the challenges. Um, so thanks and, and back to you. I'm happy to join a bit later again. Would you like to come in, Neris? Yeah, you're muted. Okay. Now I've been muted. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to participate in this forum. My name is Neris Weiss. I am the director of the procurement division in the UN uh, Secretariat in headquarters in New York. And this is a, an important forum for us, uh, not, not only to share uh, views on this important topic, but also to gain uh, support in advancement and furtherance of the sustainable development agenda. Um, the UN Secretariat procurement definitely seeks to um, support the Secretariat's effort into uh, achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. And indeed, the, the UN has been encouraged by member states to include um, considerations on economic, social, and environmental policies into the operations, into supporting the operations. Um, further to that, the um, procurement organizations that are uh, members of the procurement network within the high level committee of management have signed a statement, a procurement uh, statement by which they commit 
to include sustainable procurement in the development um, of its operation. But it's, this is to be done on a progressive uh, manner. And having said that, and uh, you know, in furtherance to what uh, Mr. Saunders, the Assistant Secretary General for the Office of Supply Chain Management had said, um, this implementation would require the effort and the approval by our legislative bodies in the case of the UN Secretariat, so the, the General Assembly. And that is due because to the current framework that we have does not expect explicitly uh, allows the uh, inclusion of sustainability considerations in the uh, procurement strategies. Uh, they do include um, the four principles of procurement. So for every uh, decision in the procurement making, we have to take into account that it is the best value for money that is in the interest of the organization, that is a process that is fair and transparent and efficient. Notwithstanding, uh, but not on a mandatory basis because our, our mandate, but uh, as a guidance, we indeed in 2019 made a complete overhaul of the UN Procurement Manual. And there's a whole chapter on sustainability considerations that address in particular the social considerations. Uh, accessibility, for example, in communication channels. The Procurement Division website has been updated to include accessibility features so um, that um, disabled vendors are able to uh, look at the business opportunities. But we are also including um, social considerations in the, um, uh, the procurement process, for example, at the time of um, reviewing the or defining the requirements so that there is no uh, vendor that is left out. Uh, because certain disabilities. We are also looking at um, the same process in market research um, so that um, uh, all vendors from um, medium-sized enterprises, uh, disab disabled vendors, women-owned businesses, they are taken into account and are not disadvantaged in participating in these business opportunities. We have also initiated a dialogue with the private sector in reckoning the, the market trends in the different commodities. And this is within the implementation of the category man management approach that was initiated in 2019. Um, so in summary, we are not fully there yet, as, as it has been said, but definitely we are working towards the goal. And in this sense, uh, the support of the legislative bodies is essential as we embark into changing the status quo. Um, I would like to, to refer to your question on COVID-19, and as Santiago mentioned, indeed, um, uh, the pandemic has uh, put a strain into the supply chain, um, but also has placed the importance of, uh, of a resilient and um, very solid supply chain. Uh, the procurement professionals that um, also was mentioned at the beginning of, of this panel, um, that might be a, a function or a role that uh, had not been regarded with the, maybe with the, um, with the how it's worth, definitely have um, played a key role in mitigating the impact of, uh, of the pandemic. Indeed, um, there have been certain commodities for which the, the, the modeling the market has been uh, very limited, um, but there have been other instances, for example, um, in commodities, for example, in, that we have long-term agreements, that the robust supply chain of our contractors together with the performance management that we conduct at the UN. This has um, provided that the supply has been uh, not necessarily disrupted, in particular for uh, commodities that are life support related. We have, for example, several examples of um, uh, contractors that um, were able to repurpose and even to align uh, their production to the immediate needs of, of the UN with the same degree of um, quality and, and expected output. Um, so as an overview, I would say that we are definitely conducting um, steps towards uh, working to the sustainable development agenda. Um, we, we have the challenge of the framework, but that does not deter us in um, as much as possible in within the mandate to include sustainability considerations um, in, in, in the procurement process. Thank you, Nairspace. Let's let's hear from UNDP now. Torben, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for <clears throat> allowing UNDP to participate in this uh, important uh, forum. So I will talk about three things, just a short introduction to what's UNDP, what we do, what is the state of procurement, 
and then finally addressing the question on how has COVID-19 affected uh, procurement and supply. Uh, in many ways, we have found that it has accelerated uh, sustainable procurement and given uh, us the opportunity to actually identify new opportunities also, but more on that later. Um, <clears throat> so UNDP is uh, the implementing arm in, in the UN system. Uh, we are on the ground in 170 uh, different countries and territories uh, where we have country offices, uh, we have five uh, regional offices, and then we have centralized procurement functions uh, here in Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen actually directly translated into English means uh, the merchant's harbor or the harbor of buyers. Uh, so we actually find it quite fitting, uh, this is known since the Middle Age, uh, that the UN procurement and supply uh, hub is located here in Copenhagen, which has a long tradition of uh, procurement and supply. So in UNDP, uh, roughly 70% of all expenditure is channeled through uh, the procurement function. So we have a huge impact and footprint on how the organization is spending their contributions. And we have a huge responsibility and obligation, of course. So that's uh, roughly 11, 12% of total UN spend is also channeled through UNDP. Um, so UNDP is, a, is the integrator of the sustainable development goals uh, in the UN system, or at least we aspire to, to be that. Uh, and that means also that we have a responsibility to build capacities uh, to transform uh, partner governments and help them on the journey uh, uh, on sustainability. The sustainable development goals, but also how to actually implement sustainable procurement. Uh, in national country systems. And this we do with programmatic support, with training programs, with capacity development, etc. Um, <clears throat> in UNDP, uh, we see sustainable, uh, sustainable procurement as the only way of procurement. Uh, it's the new normal. Uh, it's not a separate department. It's not a separate unit. Uh, it's mainstreamed into procurement. Uh, and the main shift is, of course, that we go from a narrow price focus to a total cost of ownership focus in all our procurements, uh, ideally factoring all, in all relevant social, environmental, economic uh, costs into the total cost of ownership uh, uh, paradigm. Um, that said, we also have to admit uh, there's no green button uh, to push on the keyboard. Uh, there's no magic stick. Uh, to swing. Uh, so there's basically no quick fix. There's only hard work. Uh, the devil is in the detail and we have experienced uh, every category has its distinct risks and opportunities when it comes to uh, uh, greening the supply chain, factoring uh, in social conditions and so on. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, I've just looked at our numbers. Uh, last year, we had more than 50,000 uh, suppliers, uh, uh, everything from goods, services, works. So 50,000 suppliers where we need to make sure that there's no forced labor, that, the, that they take environmental considerations. So it puts a huge demand on every buyer uh, uh, that they actually understand the concept and that they implement uh, and uh, uh, the sustainable procurement uh, principles and, and policies. Uh, so there's a, there's, there's a, it's a big challenge, we, we have to say that. Um, and, and the devil is in the detail, there's no, no, no magic solutions to that. Uh, but we are on the path to mainstream uh, procurement, uh, uh, sustainable procurement, and the time is now, right? As has been mentioned several times during the program, uh, we, we need to, to, to hit the ground running and, and, and learn fast. Um, so, and in terms of, of COVID-19, yeah, the last issue, just very shortly, we actually find that in many ways this has accelerated uh, sustainability. It has made clear, you know, uh, the importance has provided new opportunities, just that we are having this forum online uh, is a big change. Uh, we are conducting all our training programs online now and there's uh, many ways where we have actually 
reduced our carbon footprint, uh, our environmental footprint, and uh, improved the social uh, uh, conditions at the same time. So thank you very much. Um, over to you, Lila. Thank you very much, uh, Torben, and, and all of uh, of the speakers. I think we we were hearing from um, a, a very broad range of actors, whether it's from the UN or from the private sector, uh, what the current state of uh, sustainable procurement is. Uh, there are many hurdles. Uh, they can be political, they can be technical. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, there are some some amazing practices out there and some some uh, things that work really well and the opportunities are, are enormous. Um, I'm aware that we have about four minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask a very simple question to, to all of you um, and hoping for, you know, less than one minute answer. If you had to mention one thing uh, that really helped your organization in terms of advancing sustainability procurement, what what would you say? Um, is there one thing that uh, has really, you know, helped move the agenda forward? Um, just for simplicity, let's use the same order as before. So it's Francisco, Eva, Santiago, Neri Spice, and, and Torben. Thank you, Lila. Uh, as Torben said, there is no uh, green button way, easy uh, way to go, but uh, this is hard work and hard work with our uh, chain. We have a, a larger suppliers that are helping us to, with technologies and to reduce the emissions. So in our company, we reduced 60% of our greenhouse emissions in the last 15 years, introducing new technologies and new investments but we also do a lot of um, let's say wood procurement because we we are related to the for to the forest uh, and and planted forest so we work a lot with uh, small and medium-sized farmers and for those uh, normally they do not have let's say the ability to have all the the codes of conduct you know the principles and and all the organization and administration that is needed so we go hand in hand with them and we introduce more than uh, 400 of them uh, to 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 the uh, to the principles of ethics, uh, integrity, and and also sustainability. So they are really helping us to perform better on our procurement chain. So that's what we are doing. And for us, it's not uh, something not not new. We were the first company in the southern hemisphere in our business to have, let's say, an, a a forestry uh, certification with the principles of uh, economic, uh, sustain, uh, uh, environmental, and social aspects. Uh, even before this becomes now the the the, the more well known uh, ASG uh, things that we are seeing now, so uh, it, it's uh, hard work uh, uh, working with them, doing assessment during the procurement, uh, checking, uh, and having very high standards uh, on on our code of conduct of so anti-corruption uh, practices, uh, integrities, and everything else. Uh, consider reputation uh, and also uh, transferring this assessment. Uh, to our uh, supply chain. Thank you. Go ahead, Lila. Thank you, Lila. Um, the one thing uh, I think we have already heard how much, um, uh, how many risk management systems that there are out there already, uh, and and uh, perhaps one thing for me would would be that. What we hear also is very much uh, the, the focus on protecting the, the institution. You talk about the fraud, corruption, financial risks. Um, my one thing would be really to, to also see and focus on the need to protect the people, uh, which is very much, I think, also what you talked about right now, Francisco, to have that focus also on the people in, in, in the supply chain. Uh, so my concrete suggestion and wish would be that, that we actually uh, include or integrate uh, human rights due diligence into existing risk, risk management uh, processes. Because for me, that is the most effective way to, to really achieve all the dimensions of sustainable uh, procurement and thereby also living up to leaving no one behind, uh, as stated in the 2030 agenda. So, so that would be my one uh, thing to, to go for uh, when you ask like that, Lila. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, Santiago, over to you. Yeah, I will echo some of what Francisco and, and Eva have just said, which is, you know, I think there has to be a comprehensive approach, but I think that approach should, uh, you know, set the, the tone 
quite up. And in doing so, we should anchor to uh, to, to high level uh, objectives, and in particular to the to the SDGs. Um, so while there is one specific target within the SDGs in under SDG 12 that does um, I talk about sustainable public procurement practices, the reality is that many uh, of the other SDGs uh, can be uh, somehow affected through through good uh, sustainable procurement practices, including gender equality, climate change, and and so on. So I would I would say you know look. Um, uh, to the procurement functions as, as strategic levers to to deliver those additional objectives between you know besides the the, the, the immediate ones, and once the, the tone is set up up, then follow up with of course with the policies, the processes, and then in particular also harnessing the uh, you know the energy and passion that there is in on the one hand on the procurement uh, community, on, and, and I'm sure Neri Storen you know would also agree with me. There's lots of you know, seasoned and, 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 and very passionate procurement practitioners out there in the UN where, you know, they're actually very willing to, you know, if empowered to, to make that transition and likewise harness the, uh, the energy and, and, and the very good practices that the private sector uh, has. So it has to be a collaborative effort, but I think it needs to, to set up the tone from, uh, from high up and then follow through. Uh, thanks. Um, I think that I will follow on, on Santiago's uh, footsteps. And uh, I would say that um, there will be two issues that come to my mind if, if I look at what has helped uh, in uh, promoting sustainable procurement in, in my organization in the UN Secretariat. First is, uh, apart from the, from the passion of, of the procurement officials and, and the um, expertise or knowledge that they might have, but uh, something very important is the capacity building. Um, it is important that um, um, those that um, um, uh, implement or conduct the procurement function uh, definitely are pretty much aware of, of the topic. For example, what we did last year, the procurement division, um, during the um, virtual conference of the chief procurement officers of all the 35 entities of the Secretariat, we uh, had one session dedicated exclusively to sustainability considerations. Uh, and in doing so, we wanted to raise the awareness on gender equality, on accessibility, on disability function in the acquisition process. Um, this not only uh, resulted in a, in a brainstorming, but also in, in a call that indeed acted on the nomination in all the procurement offices uh, across the Secretariat of a gender focal point for procurement. And these persons have been trained and they are helping the requisitioners when uh, uh, defining requirements and when conducting market research that, for example, women on business and, and uh, medium sized enterprises or, uh, you know, vendors from uh, developing countries or economies in transitions are not left behind that, that are, uh, you know, taken into account. The second thing that I would say that it has helped a lot in, in into getting fam more, more familiar with the topic and, and advancing it is the category management approach. And, and why is that? Because with category management, you're looking at um, a creation to improve a total cost of ownership, in, but factoring quality, innovation, risk management, as, as mentioned by, by Eva and Francisco, and sustainability principles. And, and this is um, an exercise that is um, uh, a, you know, bring together uh, actors from, from different parts of the secretariat, not only procurement officials, you have the requisitioners, you have the program uh, managers, you have uh, uh, environmental um, um, uh, staff. Uh, in all this collaboration, this, this cross polarization, as I call, definitely brings and supports more the, the sustainability considerations. And third is the um, uh, engagement with the supplier community. Uh, it is important that we hear what is out there. Uh, wh what are the, the, the new trends and solutions? What are their concerns? What are the challenges that uh, uh, our suppliers uh, uh, face? And in working together with them, then uh, helping us, you know, commonly to, to reach the goal where we want to be. For example, um, it has been said that uh, sustainability uh, runs against profit, which in fact, that, that is not the case. I mean, we have seen, for example, the biggest retail companies that they have uh, 
uh, introduced from repurposed waste into new production lines and still gain a profit out of it. And I think that um, there's an opportunity for, for good partnership and collaboration between the UN system as a whole and the Secretariat in particular with the supplier community and to see how we can work together uh, in order to achieve progressively, it will not be from one day to the other, but definitely a serious commitment that this can be done uh, on a progressive basis to the advancement by 2030 and fully completion of the sustainable development. Thank you. And uh, Torben, you have the last word and we're going to close the session right after that. Thank you very much. Uh, I like that. Uh, I've been thinking, uh, you know, you, you asked about uh, one key factor. And if I can be a, a little bit provocative, I would say that the most important thing is actually outside the procurement cycle. It starts at the project stage, at the need definition. Uh, you know, once we enter the procurement cycle, we can do what we can, uh, what is possible to, to green and, and to sustain supply. But if the client wants a diesel generator, uh, we can only uh, buy one that is so eco-friendly as possible. But at the project definition stage, they might, they might want to ask themselves, can, they, can, they, can the solar panels do the job? Do we really need a diesel generator? And the same thing. Uh, do we need to buy a bulldozer? Maybe a smaller piece of equipment can do the job. So I think the most important stage and the, and, and the key learning is that sustainability and sustainable procurement starts long time before it enters uh, the procurement department. <clears throat> Thank you, Torben, and, and thank you to all of the speakers for sharing all of your insights and uh, encouragement for more sustainable procurement uh, across the board. We're going to close the session. Uh, final words of thanks to uh, our colleagues at uh, Telos, uh, Ulysses. Um, thank you very much for all the, the support in developing the, the report and also our colleagues at uh, Dubovoy, huge thanks for it and thank you all for the collaboration at the UN and, and within the companies uh, to get this uh, and, and within civil society to get this piece of work done. Thank you. Bye bye.